in this project to, to really go back and sort of escalate, excavate how Chinese nationalism has escalated towards the South China Sea issue. Uh, because it's something that's often taken for granted rather than being something that's actually been empirically documented. Um, so that's the first sort of aim here. Um, where am I calling for slides from? Uh, oh, next slide, please. Um, so that's, that's going to be the first aim, is to try to retrace the change in the quantity and the quality of nationalist sentiments towards the South China Sea from before China's more active policy there started through to around 2015 initially. Uh, and I do this using three proxy indicators of nationalism survey data from 2013, uh, Baidu search activity data, and some sort of quasi ethnographic online materials from basically online comment forums around the time when nationalism was first surging towards the South China Sea issue. Um, and uh, the main argument that I, that I want to make in relation to the rise of nationalism towards the South China Sea is that this is really something that's a byproduct of the party states, not the party states decision to actually whip up nationalism towards the issue, but a byproduct of its decision to make an assertive turn in the actual on the water policy that it was implementing in the South China Sea. And I'll show this in relation to the timing uh, between when the policy changed and when the interest in the South China Sea issue starts to surge. Uh, so, in terms of theoretical implications, I'm not sure how much of an of a ultimate contribution I'm making to the nationalism literature per se, which is often kind of bound up in the origins of nationalism, um, whether it's sort of primordialism or sort of constructionism. Um, but uh, rather than about the, being about the origins of nationalism, this is about the causes of an expansion or an intensification in nationalistic sentiment towards a particular issue. Um, and there's also a story here about media effects, uh, which I'll come to in the survey data. Uh, there's some interesting patterns that we see in relation to people's, where people get their information on uh, in, and how that corresponds with their views on the South China Sea issue. Um, and if we can get time to really delve into the consequences of this rise of South China Sea nationalism, we will see that ultimately what the PRC ends up with, even though it didn't specifically set out to boost nationalism towards this issue when it happened, they eventually were confronted with the need to respond. And that was a choice between tamping it down or channeling it into strategic purposes such as, such as signaling and mobilizing the population, arguably even some domestic motivations. Um, and then uh, the, the, the latest data that uh, comes from this 22, uh, 2022 uh, survey of many countries regarding their views of China actually sheds some light on how these nationalist sentiments inside China affect the perceptions of those other countries regarding China's foreign policy intentions, its propensity to use force and economic punishment, uh, and its likelihood of backing down, as well as, their, as well as the impact of that, very interestingly, on their policy preferences for how to deal with China, particularly in a crisis situation. So, uh, next slide, please. Um, as I said before, I don't want to get too tangled up in the literature on Chinese nationalism. Um, we have a preeminent figure in the room um, in, that, in that literature, in Professor Gries. Um, but just very, very briefly, uh, the literature on Chinese nationalism is voluminous, uh, it's large, and it can basically be broken down into four different approaches. One, the idea that nationalism is basically a tool of the state, uh, 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 a, uh, a, a strategy, of, it's a product of a strategy of state legitimation. Um, and the main effect of nationalism in this view is the resilience and stability of the state. Another version of uh, another account of nationalism in general um, basically sees uh, nationalism as much more of a social force that states actually have to respond to and reckon with. Um, and this is because nationalism taps into real social phenomena such as historical memories, group emotions, uh, social identity, and even arguably uh, the effects of technology and, and the internet. So uh, the main effect of nationalism from this perspective can be challenges to the state's legitimacy and the need for states to respond 
Next slide, please. Now, another approach to studying nationalism has been based on the uh, social psychology items in the International Social Survey Project, uh, which has generally taken nationalism to be related to, but distinct from patriotism. Patriotism, the more positive pride in oneself, self-affirming and a preference. It's measured with questions like, uh, I would rather be a citizen of my country than any other country. Nationalism, by contrast, uh, in different people's accounts, they put it together with patriotism as well, because the patriotism plus then a, a sense of superiority and a blind support for one's own country. I find this a little bit problematic because uh, as someone who's engaged with the policy side of things, if we see nationalism as being blind support for the state, whether it's right or wrong, then ultimately that kind of negates its possible policy relevance. Because if you're blindly supportive of the state, then you're not ultimately going to, to pose a challenge to the state. Uh, but I think one way out of that that Ian Johnston has pointed to in his 2017 article, uh, which is a bit of a model in terms of tracking back uh, the direction and the intensity of nationalism in China over time, um, is that it's, it's not just about these self-affirming sentiments, but also about the denigration of the other. And so he measures it in terms of the sort of, uh, agreement with stereotyping items and makes the point that nationalism is very often targeted at particular outgroups. Um, this is very, very important. Um, now, uh, this, this is important to me because uh, this South China Sea nationalism case is an example of an outgroup which isn't usually the subject of research on Chinese nationalism. It's usually, but the significant others are usually the United States and Japan. Um, when we talk about the century of humiliation, the Philippines and Vietnam are, are not usually high on the list of countries that, that pillage China during the uh, century of humiliation. Um, so it's an important alternative uh, angle on Chinese nationalism, I think. Um, and, and as I say before, uh, just also uh, this distinction that we need to draw between the origins of nations and national identity, which has been a lot of what the nationalism, the general nationalism literature has been concerned with, and the variation in targets and intensity, and maybe even volume of national, nationalist sentiments that can vary over time. Uh, so those are, the, those are the sort of basic contributions that I want to make in this research. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in particular, uh, there isn't a lot on China's South China Sea nationalism. Despite this being a very important um, issue to uh, the region, China's, uh, China's East Asian uh, neighbours uh, are very much concerned with this issue. Uh, uh, as well as becoming more and more of an issue of national identity inside China. And that's not a new phenomenon. Uh, my own thesis supervisor, Chen Jie, wrote back in the 1990s of how elites in, uh, in, in China who sincerely believed in the South China Sea claims. As ridiculous as they look to many Southeast Asian countries, the infamous so-called cow's tongue, the Nine Dash Line, um, it was sincerely believed in uh, from at least well before, as Bill Hayden's research has shown, well before the founding of the People's Republic goes back to the Republic of China uh, and the first half of the 20th century. More recent scholarly analyses of South China Sea nationalism have focused on a couple of really interesting uh, sort of a narrower phenomena, uh, including uh, I, I enjoyed Kevin Carrico's study of uh, South China Sea poetry online. Um, that, uh, that basically argued that South China Sea, the South China Sea claim is a site of fantasy for Chinese uh, internet users. Um, and this is how they, they experience this, this kind of fantasy that, 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 that bridges the disconnect uh, between, between many of the realities that they, that they experience on the ground um, and the grandiose claims and, and, and narratives that the state puts forward. Uh, another interesting uh, and quite opposite, actually, uh, study that's come out recently is Yan Huang's uh, uh, study of South China Sea tourism. And this is the opposite of fantasy, really, uh, because this is where, uh, these are precisely the people, some of the only people in China who actually experience the, South, the contested South China Sea claim firsthand by going on these cruises. Um, so that was very interesting. Um, but again, leaves open that gap of where did this South China Sea nationalism come from? And how is it being varied? How is it, how is it varying over time? Um, so uh, there, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence 
many people sort of take for granted the idea that nationalism has been rising on the South China Sea issue, um, but has it really? Can we get any empirical uh, data to bear on that? If so, what are its causes? Um, is, it, is it the media? Is it the internet? Is it the state instrumentalizing it? Um, and what are its effects? What are its effects on China's foreign policy? And what are its effects on the other side? But that's what I'm trying to get uh, at in this research here. Next slide, please. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, three proxy indicators that nationally won't work well on that to go over it again. Um, but just to point out the scope, uh, this is very much focused on nationalism at the popular level rather than at the elite level. And quite arguably, it's nationalism at the elite level that has the most direct influence on foreign policy making. So that might be more important, but it's, it's much more inaccessible to researchers like me. So I'm focused upon the nationalism at the popular level, mainly because there's a lot of assumptions being sort of taken for granted about this topic, um, and, uh, and it's time to bring some empirical evidence to bear on it. So next slide, please. So the first proxy I use is some original survey data that I fielded in uh, 2013 as part of my PhD dissertation. Um, wasn't a rep nationally representative sample as such, but it was representative within the five major cities that it was conducted. Um, and it was conducted by a commercial uh, uh, firm as part of an omnibus survey that included a bunch of other topics. Um, so it wasn't people knocking on the door and coming to ask you about the South China Sea, which uh, would have been problematic, I think more problematic from the point of view of the interpretation of the results. Um, this still remains, to my knowledge, the most detailed uh, survey that we have when it comes to Chinese views of the South China Sea issue. We asked about people's levels of attention to the issue, about the sources of information uh, that they rely upon for news about this issue, their assessment of the government's performance, their policy preferences for how it should be handled, their belief in the validity of China's various claims in the South China Sea, and also, uh, I think quite interestingly, their degree of agreement, as we will come to in a sec, uh, with um, the, the degree of agreement that this fits into those national humiliation frames that we've, that we've uh, that the nationalism literature in China has focused a lot of attention on. Next slide, please. So first of all, uh, what this survey showed was that at least by 2013, and I think uh, I made various arguments in the paper as to why we should expect that this was already the case before then, popular nationalism does exist. It's not simply uh, a, an, an elite phenomenon, uh, at least by 2013. We've got uh, nearly 46% of the respondents in these five cities uh, agree that China should send in the troops and potentially go to war. Um, in order uh, to, to handle the Philippines and Vietnam in the South China Sea. So linking that back to those nationalism <laughs> literatures and the one that I sort of flagged before is perhaps the most promising. Um, this is a, a, a very clear uh, uh, implied desire to punish the other when it comes to these, these foreign policy preferences. Uh, a desire to send in the troops, don't show the war. Um, however, uh, we do need to interpret that percentage with some care, uh, because the particular wording that I used, um, is it's a kind of wording that kind of primes you to agree with it. It's, it's sort of, in, at least in the, within Chinese language, um, it, it, it sounds like a sort of thing, especially if you stick to the online discourse, and then I'll come to that in a second. Um, it, it's, the sort of, it's the sort of wording that you'd be inclined to agree with. Um, so it might not be as high as 46% of people want a war in the South China Sea by 2013, but it's certainly a substantial proportion of the population that think that that sounds like a good idea. Um, what's interesting also is that in the same survey, we also asked uh, the same question about the Senkaku and Diario Islands issue, which was very, very heated at the time, Sino-Japanese relations. Uh, in fact, uh, Tao and Pete were writing about it um, at that time. Uh, and uh, the percentage of respondents agreeing that China shouldn't show the war to just send in, send in the troops was actually higher for the South China Sea at that time uh, than it was for the Diaoyu Senkaku Islands, despite how heated the nationalist sentiments were towards uh, Japan at the time. So that's another indication of the strength of feeling uh, and the desire to punish the outgroup when it comes to the South China Sea as of 2013, 
and I argue uh, sometime before. <coughs> Next slide, please. Uh, another interesting finding out of this was that one of the most popular options, uh, policy options, um, uh, was involving the public itself. So channeling domestic public opinion, encouraging the masses to show dissatisfaction towards the disputed country. Uh, nearly 66% of respondents agreed that that was a good way of handling the South China Sea dispute. Uh, and there's, this sort of dovetails with some other research which shows that uh, people in, in uh, this, the, other, the other study that I'm citing here was uh, based on students, but they, uh, they found that uh, the students believed that their own participation in anti-Japanese protests was actually useful, instrumentally useful to the state. And it also dovetails with a, a, a couple of little tidbits uh, from larger studies of Sino-Japanese relations such as James Riley's. Next slide, please. Um, this is where it gets interesting when it terms, in terms of how it relates to the media discourse. Because uh, what we find is uh, that it's not the state organs which are the source of this nationalist sentiment, this desire to punish the Philippines and Vietnam through military means. Actually, uh, the, the, the green is the percentage of agreement with uh, sending in the troops, and the green on this side is uh, compromise through negotiation, the more compromising option. And this is uh, how frequently people get their information on the issue from the state media, uh, from, from television in particular. So you can see, it's actually generally those that, this is never, sometimes, and often. So people who get the information from the state media are actually less inclined overall to uh, want to, to send in the troops and punish Philippines and Vietnam and the South China Sea, and they're more likely to favour compromise. Uh, so, uh, next slide please. So this, the state media are not the source of this nationalism. Um, the internet, on the other hand, you might think, well, if it's not the state media, then it's got to be that rancorous nationalistic online discourse that I'll also be talking about if we've got time. Um, but actually, the, the, it's not clear that the internet universally just drives people towards a nationalistic viewpoint, it looks much more like it's about audiences' predispositions. And on the internet, you can find what your you can find material to confirm your existing predilections. Um, and so the internet on the other it doesn't push people away from those militaristic stances like the charts in the previous slide were indicating the state media do, but uh, it sustains those militaristic preferences uh, because people can find confirmatory information if they want it. Uh, what the internet also does though, which I find quite interesting, is that uh, the people who uh, are, the people who are uh, uh, getting their information from online sources, uh, sometimes that is the people who are moderately engaged with the issue as opposed to people who are often getting information about it from the internet. Those are the people who are, you can infer that they're relatively engaged with the issue and have fairly strong pre-existing views. It's those that are getting the internet uh, information sometimes that believe most strongly in China's claims. And this is consistent across all three of the major South China Sea disputes. And this relates to some media theories from Philip Converse back in the 60s and the exposure acceptance model, which basically says that there's people moderately engaged in the middle who are the most subject to media influence. So that's the interpretation that I have of, of this pattern here. But it's another, uh, I'd, I'd be interested to hear if there are alternative explanations uh, from among the audience. Next slide, please. And this is also quite interesting, last slide about the, uh, the, the survey results. Um, we see overwhelming agreement with the proposition that the ongoing presence of the Philippines and Vietnam on islands claimed by China in the South China Sea is uh, a matter of national dignity. It's a matter of the state's dignity, for sure. Uh, it's a continuation of the century of humiliation by the watcher. More than 80% agreement with that proposition. Um, and it only, it only goes down a little bit when you start talking about the Chinese nation rather than making it specifically about the state. Uh, so this is quite interesting because uh, I don't think this is a, a position that the party state particularly finds useful. Say, so we have wished that, you know, propound the, uh, the, the century of humiliation narrative, the point of that, 
has been to re-legitimize the state. So having narratives like this and interpretations of like this floating around is not exactly beneficial to the state's legitimacy. So from that we can infer that you know, this is probably an indication of a more popular interpretation of the current status quo, as of 2013 at least, uh, in the South China Sea, rather than something that's propounded by the state. And we'll see how that framing of the century of humiliation has played out in terms of the way people talk about it online. Next slide, please. How are we looking for time? Um, yes, okay. Uh, so the second, second proxy that I look at is the internet search activity. And while this is not a direct measure of nationalism as such, it, what it's useful for is showing us when, fairly precisely, because it's a daily reading from the Baidu, Baidu, uh, Baidu Index, it's like Google Trends, gives you a daily reading of the level of internet search activity, this level of demand for information uh, among the public on the topic. So it gives us a good example, a, a, a good idea of the fairly precise timing of when people really got interested in the issue. So this is a good way to track the trajectory of those nationalist sentiments. Um, next slide, please. So this is the big picture from 2006 through to 2012. And what we can see here is that you know, the level of Biden search demand for information on the South China Sea is pretty consistently low all the way through until the first quarter of 2009. So that's when it first ticks up. Then it sort of scuds along for a bit and then it surges again in, to a new high in the third quarter of 2010, and then it really takes off in the middle of 2011. So let's look in a little more detail at those three sort of inflection points. Next slide, please. So this is the first one in the first quarter of 2009. And what we see here is, uh, this is March the 5th, when China launches its campaign of harassment against a US spy ship in the South China Sea. It creates a serious international incident. And it's when the United States chooses to go public about this incident that uh, the foreign ministry is forced to respond. And it's only then, it's not the incident itself, it's only after the foreign ministry comments on the incident that the Chinese netizens start to demand information about it. And it surges when the central television uh, bring, uh, starts to cover the issue. So that's the first, first sort of takeoff. Uh, early 2009 um, and the point about the significance of it, this being in early 2009 is that, that this is well into China's more assertive foreign policy in the South China Sea. Um, this is some other research that I've done has quite clearly pinpointed it as starting from around 2006 or 2007 at the latest that China really starts to build up its presence in the disputed area and to regularly coerce the other countries there. So this is more than two years earlier. So it can't be this surge in nationalistic sentiments uh, that drove the South China Sea uh, expansion policy. Uh, next slide, please. Zooming in now on the 2010 uh, surge in interest towards the South China Sea issue, we see here, uh, this is where Hillary Clinton declares the US has a national interest in the South China Sea for the first time. Uh, and once again, it's not Hillary Clinton's statement itself, but rather the PRC party states responses to the Hillary Clinton statement that really drive the uh, demand for information on the South China Sea issue to a new high. And then it kind of, it, 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 it's sustained for a, a matter of a couple of weeks here. And then we have hawkish generals like Luo Yuan and Dai Xu, these guys, these external propaganda, uh, uh, military external propaganda experts starting to really heat up the rhetoric about it pushes it to the, to the first, uh, this is a new high, where it gets close to 4,000. Uh, so that's the, that's the second, so the, in, the, in the third quarter of 2010. And this is the background from which the third surge, which I pointed to the much bigger one um, uh, in 2011, comes from. Next slide, please. So what happens here is that it's China's uh, actions cutting the cables of a Vietnamese survey ship which really, really pushes the tensions up in terms of Vietnam's response, military drills, high-strung rhetoric. And when that reaches the Chinese audience, it really pushes the, the, uh, the, the level of nationalistic fervor uh, to a new high. Now I say nationalistic fervor, you can't just assume that nationalistic fervor is what's underpinning these surges, 
uh, we have to look at it in terms of the actual content of what was, what was going on on the internet at the time. So that's the third proxy indicator that I'll come to now. Next slide, please. The point being that ultimately this is the state's policy changes and then the level of demand for information, the level of feeling uh, about the issue surges in, uh, inside China. So it's not the other way around. It's, it's the policy change followed by the surge in nationalistic sentiments. Uh, next slide, please. So now we come to the content of that surge in nationalistic sentiments. Um, so this, this comes from a uh, few years I spent sort of lurking around the internet um, at, around these times that, that people were really first getting uh, uh, riled up about South China Sea issues. Um, and uh, essentially these online comments, at least at the time, um, it's a bit of a thing of the past now, uh, in Xi Jinping's era, uh, the, uh, the Liu um, the, the comment section of news articles on websites is much more tightly controlled and uh, there's, there's much, more, much less scope for uh, interesting conversations to happen there. But around that time of 2009 to 2013, uh, it was quite a different situation. And it was a little bit like does above, uh, or maybe, maybe more accurately compared to shouts above, uh, where people would, would uh, post their views in a public place um, and, and, and have other people come and make comments on the views that they posted in public. Uh, so next slide, please. So what we find in this wave, um, beneath this wave of national feeling towards the South China Sea issue uh, from 2009 through 2013, is really uh, uh, an overwhelming sense of grievance against the party state for allowing this situation to persist. Uh, and, and, and it's linked to that fundamental um, issue that Xi Jinping himself, when he, when he first came to power, described as being a matter of life and death for the party. It's corruption. So it was constantly being compared to, they, they don't want to assert the South China Sea claim for real because they're too corrupt. They don't really care about the nation's territory. Uh, they're, they're, uh, this, this was a good one. Their bottom line is Beijing's second ring road. So when these, <laughs> when these small countries will, will, uh, will, will reach the second ring road, that's when they'll start to actually defend the nation. Uh, next slide, please. We've got a few more examples. Um, so, in particular, this, there was a particular surge in this uh, on the 20th of July of 2011, uh, which was widely condemned, including on Weibo, actually, which is generally regarded as the more, at the time, as the more liberal social media. Uh, but Weibo turned very, very nationalistic and describing it as, as, as another watcher. Um, that was the day that, on, on, in the morning, China announced a new agreement with ASEAN countries on the implementation of the earlier Declaration of Conduct on, uh, of parties in the South China Sea. And it, so it looked, you know, people didn't really know the details, but it looked like China had signed up. A second interpretation has been uh, that in the following years, uh, scarborough Shoal dispute between the Philippines and China, uh, China was actually able to, uh, the, the nationalist sentiments, when the nationalist sentiments swelled up, they were actually able to channel those nationalistic sentiments into deterring the Philippines from further resisting China's, uh, uh, further contesting China's control of Scarborough Shoal. Uh, and, and the result has been that China, there's a change in the status quo, and China actually was able to successfully assume actual control of this disputed uh, feature. Um, I think this, this goes to this question of, it's a common meme, the idea that uh, nationalism is a double-edged sword, Xuan Ren did. Um, I think this meme has a, has a bit of validity, obviously, there's, there's, there's something there. But I think there's also serious problems um, with seeing nationalism as a double-edged sword. Um, on the one hand, it doesn't take account of the fact that uh, the, an authoritarian party state has a number of levers at its disposal to be able to blunt the other side of the sword if it's coming back to, 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 to uh, put it in danger. Uh, censorship, propaganda, information controls, etc. It's well known in China. Um, the metaphor doesn't really take account of that. It sort of implicitly says that both sides are, are kind of dangerous to the party. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, as PRC party state analysts have identified, actually getting a bit of a cut from nationalist public sentiments can be beneficial to you in an international bargaining setting. Um, 
And, uh, and, and, and then thirdly, uh, the idea that these nationalist sentiments actually constrain Beijing from backing away from its claims, it's kind of problematic because when you think about it, what evidence do we actually have that Beijing would want to back away from these claims in a context in which its, its power in the region is rising? Um, we need some kind of reason to believe that Beijing would actually want to back away from its South China Sea claims in order to accurately understand it as being constrained by this, from compromising by these nationalist sentiments. Uh, next slide. So, uh, there's a number of ways in which, this brings us to the, the more recent data. Um, so there's a number of ways in which these nationalist sentiments could be interpreted by foreign countries. Uh, I mentioned the views of the party state analysts who have seen it to be useful to China on, on different occasions, but is it actually useful? How does it affect the perceptions of the other side? Uh, these nationalist expressions are fundamentally ambiguous. They require interpretation. And there's different interpretations available. It could be the state mobilizing the public for a fight. It could be the state making a credible threat, tying its own hands. It could be the state appealing to show that public opinion is on its side to try to bolster the international legitimacy of its position. Domestic interpretations, there's at least as many. It could be a diversion. It could be the state letting off a safety valve because the national sentiments are getting too, too dangerous to control. So just let them out, but it's not, not going to obey them. Um, it could be that the state simply isn't strong enough to tamp down nationalist sentiments of, of, of this level of intensity. Or another popular interpretation, uh, I've anecdotally found to be very popular in Japan, maybe for psychological reasons actually, uh, is that nationalistic sentiments, anti-Japanese sentiments, are uh, a function of internal intra-CCP uh, politics. And it's one faction using anti-Japanese sentiments against the other. So possibly possibly a, a, a psychological connection there because it essentially sort of reassures you that actually it's, it's not really because they hate us that much, it's just internal politics. So there's all these different interpretations available. Uh, next slide, please. So how do, how do observers actually uh, interpret uh, China's signals in, or China's, China's domestic uh, goings on in these types of situations? Uh, we looked into this in the Sinophone Borderlands survey uh, in 2022. Uh, by, I put a survey, uh, a, a, a survey experiment into, uh, into the survey, wrapping up or do we have time to? Yeah. So, uh, and this included six countries that are involved uh, in the South China Sea in one way or another. Uh, so, just very quickly introduce you to some of the sort of headline results. Next slide, please. So, what happens when uh, this their country, when the, when the when the when the citizens uh, are told that their country is in a crisis with China, and then China? Uh, either makes a public statement, so bringing the, bringing the issue to the attention of its domestic nationalist constituencies, or the internet explodes in China, or street protests. So uh, the, the Chinese masses are on the streets as they protesting against the other country uh, and criticizing the government from those nationalistic angles. Uh, and so what we see here is actually, uh, there is no predictable effect for the PRC. If they believe that it is going to have a certain effect, it might or it might not, because there's wide variation across whether countries actually think that uh, these nationalistic indications um, are indicating that, that China is more likely to use military force, that it's more likely to uh, impose economic punishment, or it's likely to have backing down. So we can see here, um, uh, the, the yellow bars here are the change in people's estimation of the likelihood that China will use military force across different countries. And you can see that actually no countries thought significantly, oh, uh, we've got, oh yeah, yeah. No countries, no countries had a significant increase in their estimation of China's resolve to use military force after China made a public statement. Um, so that goes against some international relations theories that Pete and I were discussing just before. Uh, James, James Fearon's theory of audience costs in particular, where countries make a public statement in order to bolster the credibility of, of their uh, threats. Um, Malaysians 
were particularly likely to link online nationalism to the likelihood of China using military force. Uh, that's this one here. Uh, it's the, the orange bar. That, that result is statistically significant. Uh, Singaporeans are the ones that tend to see uh, nationalistic protests, that's the red bars here, as a credible signal that uh, China uh, could be about to use military force, that's the red bars here, um, and significantly less likely, to, uh, China's significantly less likely to back down, according to Singaporeans, once they receive a dose of the Chinese masses in the streets. Uh, but other countries are very different. Um, and uh, all six of the countries uh, where the scenario was in the South China Sea uh, basically saw China to some degree or another. Most of the results are not statistically significant, but they're all in the same direction. Uh, less, China is less likely, seen as less likely to back down in the crisis after uh, um, uh, uh, these forms of nationalism are delivered to the target population. Uh, just one last uh, bit of analysis out of this new survey. Uh, next slide, please. So that's, and this is very interesting about the effects that these uh, nationalist protests, uh, online warmongering and public statements actually have on these countries' preferences for how to deal with the crisis with China. So if you look at the Australians, uh, this, is, this is the option of avoiding escalation. So be cautious and avoid escalation in the crisis. This is the uh, more militant option of uh, send in the military and call in the US for, for backup. Uh, and this is the sort of more neutral option of stand firm, stand your ground and cop the economic costs that China's gonna send your way. Uh, so what you see here is that Australians become much more hawkish. They're much less likely across all three of those forms of nationalistic expression in China, much less likely to uh, want to avoid escalation and handle the crisis in a low key way. And uh, at least for the statements and the internet warmongering, uh, they become more likely uh, uh, to want to send in uh, the military and call in the United States. Uh, so basically nationalism uh, in China is, is provocative to Australian uh, 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 observers. But it's not the case in other countries. So China's not gonna know uh, what the reactions are gonna be. Um, the Philippines, on the other hand, uh, were the most likely to be deterred by online warmongering. Uh, this was a statistically significant result, um, and uh, that is actually consistent with what happened in that case that I mentioned just before in 2012, the Scarborough Shock, where there was this wave of online warmongering, and the Philippines actually changed its position after that, um, and, and ultimately ceded control of the disputed shoal to China. Uh, Malaysians, interestingly, were more likely to favour military escalation. They were less likely to favour uh, being cautious, but they were more likely to favour military escalation across all of those uh, um, uh, nationalism treatments. Uh, and then finally, Singapore, despite taking the street protests very, very seriously, as I showed in the previous slide, the Singaporean respondents nonetheless were no, less, no more likely to want to back down um, as a result, even though they thought, even though their estimation of China's resolve and resolve to use military force even had gone up as a result of receiving these street protests coming at them, they weren't more likely to, for, to, want, us, to want Singapore to, to back down or to even handle the crisis in a more cautious way. So it's, it's all over the place. Uh, and that's, I think, a, a quite a significant finding in itself. Uh, because there is evidence that the PRC believes that it has certain effects on the other side, um, which and, and those beliefs on the PRC side may very well be mistaken uh, based on this evidence here. So that pretty much wraps it up, I think. If we look at the next slide, I think it's just got my email on it. So yeah, uh, very much welcome any feedback, uh, questions and comments, and please feel free to be in touch about any of these topics, um, and I'll look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Great, thank you.